Thank you for uh, worshiping with us this morning. How many of you uh, have started kind of full into Christmas season? You've been experiencing Christmas parties and gatherings. Any, any Christmas parties yet? Have you attended? We had our staff party this week. And uh, just, just a wonderful opportunity to spend some time uh, outside of work, just celebrating the birth of Christ, looking forward to that, uh, just cherishing time with each other. We exchanged gifts. And I think everybody uh, everybody was treated pretty well this year uh, in the gift exchange, so that was nice. I spoke with some other people, said that they had their staff uh, parties or their work parties already, so those things are already being checked off. The radio waves are filled with Christmas songs. Uh, it's just a great time of year that everything points, whether, whether uh, it's coming from a source who wants to honor God with their lives or not, it seems like right now everything points to the birth of his son. It's our season. We get to just uh, enjoy uh, the whole world looking to the birth of Christ. And I hope that when we come together on Sunday mornings that you, uh, you find this just kind of the pinnacle of your week, uh, the opportunity to study his word, especially as we move through the prophecy of Isaiah, looking at the coming of of the the promised child of course not everybody agrees on the holiday and on the season and what's most important in it and uh, there are there are different arguments and uh, just critical conversations that happen in it I think probably if we are going to be truly unified as a church family we should probably settle a couple of those so uh, I know that the Christmas movies are a topic of debate often and so there are some there's some movies that are contested as to whether they're a Christmas movie or not. And I just need to know who I'm dealing with this morning. So I'm going to give you a movie and you tell me whether it is or is not a Christmas movie. OK, uh, let's start with uh, 1987 Lethal Weapon Christmas movie. Oh, I got a Christmas movie. We got like some fist pumps and I got a lot more people laughing, which means you maybe have your doubts. OK. All right, so maybe not a Christmas movie by some standards. Um, what about, uh, let's see, here's a, another, ooh, Batman Returns. That was a classic, classic holiday piece of cinema, wasn't it? Yeah? No? That one's hard for me. I, I've heard people try to make that argument. I think, nope, I'm, I'm not buying Batman Returns as a Christmas movie, even though it takes place around the holidays. One of my personal favorites growing up, Gremlins. There's no way that is a Christmas movie just because he puts a little Christmas hat on his head for a couple minutes. That's, that does, that's no Christmas movie. Here's one that I think is a legitimate uh, debate, though. Die Hard. Die Hard. Christmas movie? How many of you say Christmas movie? How many of you say no? No, it's Bruce Willis and it's terrorists. There's no way that's a Christmas movie. You know, sometimes it's hard to agree, isn't it, on what, uh, what constitutes a Christmas themed uh, movie or song. There are some classic Christmas songs that we sing in church that you hear on the radio constantly. People uh, sing them when they go caroling to their neighbors. And, and I've read through some of those classic hymns. I mean, these are, these are songs that I love. They're part of kind of church history. And, and when you read the lyrics, there are several of them that are not actually about Christmas. One is about the second coming, still about Jesus, still a great song. It's not a Christmas song. And, and so we get into these kind of fun debates from time to time. Today may feel a little bit like that for you. As we continue through Isaiah's prophecy, the second title or the second name that Isaiah gives is one that feels, when we start to unpack it, a little strange as far as kind of the, the vibe that it gives talking about Christmas. Overall, Isaiah is talking about what it means for God to be with his people. God with us. We were told that the child would be named Emmanuel, God with us. What does that look like? And so we're taking several weeks to, to look at what it means for God to be with us. What does life feel like or look like when God dwells with his people? For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. 
And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They are four titles. Counselor, God, Father, and Prince. Each title has a, a descriptor with it tied to it. He's a wonderful counselor. We talked about that last week. The one whose wisdom and direction will, will leave us standing in amazement, bewildered at his incredible understanding of all things. An ability to not just show us a path through, but to walk with us through all of life's challenges into eternity. He is the wonderful counselor. His counsel is full of wonder for us. His ways are not our ways, and we often are amazed at what he might suggest or call us to. Mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, today we look at this second one. Mighty God. A couple of years ago, our Christmas kind of Advent series was on the names of God out of the Old Testament. It didn't feel very much like a, a Christmas series, but it, it helped us understand the God who would send his son to earth. Today, we are going to pick up another name of God that we didn't cover when we, we worked through them before. But we're told that he would be called Mighty God, the Hebrew phrase or expression for Mighty God is El Gabor. El Gabor. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, or El Gabor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then Isaiah goes on, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This second title, El Gabor, Mighty God, Isaiah is telling us two things about this God. This child is, in fact, God. He's clear in this section of scripture that I just read to you. In fact, four times in those two verses, Isaiah tells us that, that God is coming to earth to be with us. To us, a child is born. That is a very natural thing to happen. This child will be human. He will be born as a child. We know to expect that the Messiah will not just come and appear and, and kind of appear out of nowhere as an adult, but he will come as a child. But then this second phrase, a son is given, tells us that the, the child comes in a supernatural way, in a miraculous way. Last week we said that, that God identified that it would be a sign, a miraculous sign, a miraculous wonder to the people how this child would be born. A son would be given in a way that no one could possibly explain, except God did. That, he, that his mother would conceive by the work of the Holy Spirit. A son is given in supernatural ways. It's, a, it's an act of God himself coming to be with his people. Verse seven says of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. You see, God is telling us through Isaiah that the, the scope of the greatness of his reign, that the reach of his authority would have no end. He is unlimited in that which he oversees. He has authority over all things. There have been some incredibly powerful, powerful leaders throughout history, good and bad both. Some of them have, have ruled over millions and millions, even billions of people. But none of them has had unlimited reach in their authority. None of them was able to declare what they desired or what ought to happen and universally have all of creation immediately submit and give, give reverence for 
his commands. There has never been a leader like that, and we're told that this child would have no end to the reach of his government. His rule and authority is unlimited. Isaiah goes on and says that he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Not only does his reach extend to all of creation, but it, it is without end. He will reign forever and ever. There is no end to the duration of his authority. How can this possibly be? Well, Isaiah says that, that the zeal of the Lord, the passion, the fervor, the strength and power of the Lord himself will see to it. God is intimately tied to the birth of this child that will be born, the son that will be given to us. God's fingerprints are all over the entire event. God is with us in his incredible strength and might. El Gabor, the, the term El referring to God. Isaiah says this child will be God, El. But he will not just be any God, he's mighty God. El Gabor, the mighty and strong one. We know he is mighty. We've seen the evidence of his strength and his power. Isaiah describes it here, but it, it goes beyond that. And this is where this title, this name feels strange. For us, when we think about Christmas and the lights and the manger, the baby, the, the animals quietly bang in the background, the young parents lovingly looking over their child. You see, Gabor, Gabor is a military term. If you look through the scriptures, you find it used dozens of times, and most of the time it's in reference to some sort of military event or individual. In fact, more times than not, it's not referring to God. It's referring to great champions of warfare. Of those who have gone into battle and who have, to legendary status, put their will on those that they oppose. These are the most elite of fighting forces, the most valiant, the strongest, the mightiest warriors, those who would be considered chiefs or champions or governors over entire military units. These are the greatest warriors of history called and referred to with this term Gabor. They are the mightiest of men. These are the Army Rangers, the Navy, SEAL Team 6, the elitist of the elite. These are the guys you don't mess with. They're the ones who simply don't lose. They don't run from any fight. They come out victorious. Their force, their knowledge, their skill is overwhelming and strikes fear in the hearts of all those who would come against them. The book of Chronicles talks about the kings of Israel. And there are lots of names and generations, and, and it's not a very exciting book in lots of places. But chapter 11 of First Chronicles is a fascinating chapter. It talks about David and some of the men that he began to, to rally to himself as he took reign over the nation of Israel. After Saul's death, David was coming to power. God had promised that he would serve as king. And, and to secure that, that authority, that position of authority, David brought with him men who would defend his honor, who would serve him to their death. And First Chronicles chapter 11 names several of them. Yashobim, who were told killed 300 warriors in a single event. Imagine a soldier, hand-to-hand -hand combat, cutting down 300 of his enemy in a single day. An incredible feat. There were others, though. Eliezer, who stood with David against the entire Philistine army when the rest of Israel's armies fled and ran away in fear. 
David and one other man stood against the Philistine army and held them at bay because of their incredible, incredible military prowess. There are three mighty warriors who were told in that same chapter attacked and broke through the Philistine army on their own on another occasion. You remember the Philistines, they had warriors who were truly giants. More than eight feet tall stood Goliath and his brothers and others like him. The Philistines were an incredible fighting machine and, and yet these three warriors were able to break through their lines. A man like Benaniah, who killed Moab's two greatest warriors. You see, everybody had their best soldiers. Benaniah was able to destroy and kill two of one of Israel's greatest enemies, two of their greatest warriors. If that wasn't enough, he was the same person who, on a snowy day, climbed into a pit with a mountain lion and slayed the mountain lion. He was an incredible warrior. All of these men, people of legend, stories were told of them. In fact, we know that, that the people sang of David. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. This chant and song echoed through the streets of Jerusalem often because of the stories that had been passed along of David's military exploits. These these are men who don't back down, they don't run away, and they don't lose. These are the greatest warriors of Israel's history. And the prophet Isaiah says that a child is to be born. And one of the ways he will be known is that he is the greatest, mightiest warrior God. I told you that Israel or that Isaiah's prophecy came at a pivotal time in, in Israel's history last week. It was a time when the nation was turning away from God. They were considering the, the gods that their neighbors worshipped. They'd begun worshipping some of these false gods, bringing idols into their home, praying for crops to be restored, praying for safety in battle, praying for all kinds of things, for children to be born to them and their spouses. It was in this season that, that God says, through Isaiah, a day is coming, a child would be born to you, and he will be God with us. But not a God like these others. This is the mighty warrior God, the one who goes before you and slays all enemies. God is coming. He is fearsome and mighty in all he does. Psalm 24, 8 says, Who is this King of glory? The Lord, the strong and mighty, El Gabor, mighty in battle. <coughs> Exodus 15, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. He is El Gabor. Deuteronomy 10, 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. He is the great God. The others don't compare to him. Mighty, Gabor, and awesome. God is not like the others. He is above. He is more powerful. He is mighty. His strength extends far beyond all of them. He will not back down from them. He will never quit coming against them. He will show himself to be powerful and mighty over them, and he will cut them down. And then we see David's life play out as, as an image, as a picture of this God who will come to earth. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, David takes lunch to his brothers. They are serving in the, Israeli, in the Israelite military. They have come and drawn battle lines against the Philistines once again, and the Philistines have a Gabor of their own, a mighty warrior of legendary status, standing over nine feet tall. His name is Goliath. He has other servants simply to carry his armor for him into battle, multiple men who carry 
carry his equipment so that when he stands, he may taunt the Israelite armies. David shows up and he hears the, the murmurings and the chatter of this incredible Gabor, this warrior that has come against them, challenging any, any warrior. David, who has killed his tens of thousands, his mighty men who have all of these exploits, Goliath would gladly meet any one of them or anyone that maybe perhaps could be possibly even greater than them. Goliath is calling Israel's greatest warriors out and no one, no one will face him. No one will face the great Gabor of Philistia, <laughs> except David, who sees this giant warrior, this mighty warrior, he cries out to God, David does, to Jehovah, the Lord of the armies of heaven, Jehovah Sabaoth. He knows that God is the greatest and ultimate champion. This Gabor of Philistia is nothing to the Gabor of Israel, the Lord of all lords. It is by his might and his power that David runs forward and says to the giant, today I will cut you down. Because as far as the stories have reached of your greatness, there is one who rules over Israel, who is powerful beyond words. He is El Gabor, and he will fight on my behalf today, and he will cut you down. We, we get so excited about the story of David and Goliath. It is a story of two champions. And God reveals himself in the midst of it. You see, he is El Gabor. He is the mighty God. And because of his might, he reigns victorious in all that he does. There is no question or doubt that it will happen. God's might assures, guarantees of his victory over all things. Isaiah says later in his prophecy in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 13, the Lord will march out like a champion, like a Gabor, a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. You see, Isaiah doesn't just make a passing comment that he is a, a mighty God, a strong God. Isaiah laces and threads this theme through his prophecy. This is the great warrior God who marches out, rallies a cry, and defeats his enemies in all situations. What does that have to do with Christmas? Again, Isaiah is writing to a nation terrified for their future. A nation that has abandoned this God, a nation that has turned their backs on him, a nation that sees, sees destruction coming on the horizon. They understand that dark days are ahead and they're fearful for them. And Isaiah is speaking on behalf of this warrior God that there is hope with the child who will come. God with us gives us hope. This is the hope of Christmas, that this child is all-powerful. He is the champion warrior, king, and God in their desperate situation. He is the ultimate champion in all battles. Isaiah 10, 20 says, In that day, the remnant of Israel, the survivors of Jacob, will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Who is Isaiah talking about? The Holy One of Israel is none other than the child that he's already mentioned. God with us, Jesus, Emmanuel. You can read through chapter 10 sometime this week. And read of how God will come and will secure victory for his people. He is the champion who guarantees victory. He is coming to secure his interests. He is coming and will be victorious. <clears throat> and Isaiah tells us through his prophecy 
that God's interests are not just in his own glory or in praises being sung about him. It is not in his reputation, but his interests extend to that which he has made. This great and powerful king, this mighty God, has interest in that which he has made, which has run amok, which has gone astray, which is dissolving and eroding and crumbling morally. And physically, he has interest in his creation. Specifically, he has interest in and humanity within that creation, the one that he desires to have relationship with and to dwell with for all of eternity. More specifically than that, he has interest in the nation that he has called out to be a blessing to the rest of humanity, the ones that he has reserved for himself, that he has set aside as a priesthood to represent himself to the rest of humanity. And and beyond that, personally, he is the God whose interests expend, extend most notably to you and to me. This mighty God has interests in each and every person, each of us. And because of those interests, <clears throat> he comes to earth as a child. He takes on flesh as a human being. He enters into time and space with all of its limitations. A limitless God does this. A mighty God empties himself into humanity. And he comes to a young couple, Mary and Joseph. He tells them that this is going to happen. Messiah is coming to save God's people. They, they know that this is true. They've been waiting like the rest of their people for centuries. And he comes to young Mary and says, it's going to happen soon. And it's not just going to happen soon, but it's going to happen through you, Mary. Joseph has in mind to divorce her quietly. To, to not bring public disgrace on her, but but to allow her to go and do that which God has set her aside for. And, and then God speaks to Joseph as well in Matthew chapter 1. Told that after he cons had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Remind me, the name of the angel? You recall? Who's the angel that spoke with Mary and Joseph? Gabriel, Gabor El, Gabriel, the mighty one of God, came to announce the birth of the mighty God. Gabriel comes to Joseph in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Why was he coming? Gabor El, Gabriel, the mighty one of God, comes to say that God Almighty is coming to earth to save his people from their sins was the message. God with us. El Gabor, the mighty one of heaven, is coming to save his people from their sins. You see, his might makes him victorious. It guarantees and gives us hope that he will accomplish all that he desires. And what he desires, his accomplishments, are for us to make things right again. <laughs> God's very might, his strength and his power moves to make things right. He is a restorative God. We've talked about that as well several times. He is a God who saves and restores. He rescues out of what enslaves us and restores us to that which he had originally intended and envisioned and created. He makes things right. Isaiah 10, 20 and 21 in that day. 
The remnant of Israel, the survivors of Jacob, they will no longer rely on him who struck them down, but will rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah continues, a remnant, remnant will return. A remnant of Jacob will return to El Gabor. Mighty God. His might and his strength will bring his people back to himself. <coughs> if God's victory, guaranteed victory, is our hope in Christmas, then his interest in us, the fact that his might draws his people back and makes things right again is our hope, or I'm sorry, our peace for Christmas. Knowing that, that all things are, will be made right again, that God will restore that which he had created, knowing that that will come gives us peace. In the midst of our darkness, we have peace knowing that El Gabor is still at work. He continues. He is able to execute his perfect plans. And the Bible tells us that he does it <coughs> in perfect love and perfect justice. Isaiah isn't the only one who told us this. As you look through the Old Testament, prophet after prophet tells us about God's intentions to restore his people to himself. They point to the New Testament, to the child who will restore all of humanity, who will receive him to himself. Jeremiah says it in chapter 32. Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Why? Because he is mighty God. He is El Gabor. You show love to thousands, but bring punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. You show love and yet bring punishment. <coughs> Jeremiah goes on, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty. Great are your purposes, mighty are your deeds. And then if we skip down a few more verses to verses 37 to 40. With Babylon bearing down on the nation of Judah, Jeremiah says, I will surely gather them from all the lands where I banish them in my ferocious Anger and great wrath. This is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah to his people. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me and that they will then go, then all will go well for them for and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. And I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all of my heart and my soul. We continue to see in all of these passages the zeal of the Lord, the passion of the Lord. Those core desires of the Lord Almighty and his Ability and strength and will to bring his people back from destruction, back from darkness, back from all that distracted them and carried them away from himself. <coughs> he makes all things right. Uh, flowing out of his mighty love for them. He also is mighty in justice, doing that which is right. The Lord executes his plans as he wills. He cannot be defeated. He wills that you and I might know him and respond to him and come to him in humble obedience, forsaking that which we have engaged in sinfully against his order. He promises his love to those who will respond in this way. And all of this instills confidence. 
Because of his might, we can have confidence. This is the joy of Christmas. His hope and his peace also come with incredible, joyful expression because we know that it will happen because he is the mighty God. He is the greatest warrior from heaven. He cannot be defeated or overpowered. He causes everything within his grace and his will to flourish and to grow. The prophets warned of his discipline but always spoke afterwards of his restoration, his discipline to, to separate wickedness from righteousness, that he might draw to himself that which is righteous and good and pure, fit for his presence. The prophet Zephaniah says in Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves he will take great delight in you. This is not just a mighty warrior who takes pleasure in cutting down. He's a mighty warrior God who saves those he loves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Even he experiences joy as he saves his people. Back to Isaiah chapter 12 this time. In that day, Isaiah says, <clears throat> You will say, I will praise you, Lord, although you were angry with me and your ang uh, you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely, God is my salvation and I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my salvation. My defense with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. This mighty warrior God, the one who cannot be thwarted, the one who is, has interest in you, who comes to save, rescue, restore, and draw back to himself rejoices as you respond to him. Christmas is about a child with infinite authority and power, infinite reach that has no end. He calls people to himself. His desire is that we might respond and he has accomplished by his might victory over that which enslaved us, our sin and our death. And he's shown authority over both. May we say this Christmas, I will praise you, Lord. Although you have been angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely you are my salvation. I will trust in you and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, you are my strength. And my defense, you have become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. May that be our prayer, even this morning. Will you join me? Oh God, great and mighty God, El Gabor, we have no need to doubt. We have no need to doubt your strength and your ability, your might, and the ferocity of your love and your strength. God, we come to you this morning. We worship and praise you for the child born to us. Mighty God, he is our champion of heaven. He alone is victorious over every threat that we face, over the ultimate threat of our own sin and brokenness, our own weakness. Father, his birth, his birth this, this year, we are reminded, secures our hope. His birth secures our peace. His birth secures our joy. And today, and each day going forward, we worship you because of your great might. We, we are drawn to you as wonderful counselor. 
We trust you because you are our wonderful counselor. But God, we, we find strength and confidence, peace, hope, and joy because you are mighty God. And we worship you today for it. Amen.
shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise we will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise She's a 